is sovereign over us. And I just pray this morning that we would rest in that truth, that we would rest in the reality that God is good and that God is great, and so that we can trust Him in the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of fear, in the face of anxiety, of, in the face of a troubled soul. We can trust Him. And oftentimes, God works in our waiting. And I love that line out of that song, and it spoke to me during a season of waiting in my own life um, in the last two years or so. And I would play that song over and over and over, and it just comforted me to know that God is at work in our waiting. When we are in that awkward time between promise made and promise fulfilled. And that's where we find our scripture this morning is a time in redemptive history where there is this in-between moment where Jesus was still on the earth, having spent 40 days with his disciples teaching about the kingdom of God. And yet he had not yet ascended into heaven to be glorified so that he could pour out the Holy Spirit. And it's in this in-between time that Jesus tells his disciples to wait. And we're going to pick that up in Acts chapter 1. And so the background here, as I mentioned, it, Jesus had just risen from the grave. He had been teaching his disciples for about 40 days about the kingdom of God. That he had already shown uh, himself to be resurrected. And there was good news, but there was confusion and some disorientation. And Jesus begins to speak in Acts chapter 1. Verse 1, we'll pick it up. Now, let me pause here and invite you to stand. Even though you're not here in the sanctuary, I just invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word. And, and if you're visiting with us for the first time, why do we stand for the reading of God's Word? It's because it's a, an acknowledgement and it's a, a way of honoring God's Word, recognizing that this is Spirit-breathed, God-inspired. This is living and active. These are the very words of God written by human authors, but yet inspired and governed by the Holy Spirit. And so as we stand to read God's word in Acts chapter one, verse one, it says this in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, with you at this time, restore the kingdom to Israel. And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of of the earth. Would you just join me in praying? This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you that it is living and active, that it points us to Jesus. And so we just ask, Holy Spirit, wherever your people find you this morning, even those that are far from you, you would draw them in through this scripture and that you would illuminate Christ, that we might see him more clearly and teach us your ways, that we would walk in them. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, as March 15th, I became the lead pastor of Lodi Community Church and Currently, we are still living in Elk Grove, and so often throughout the week and on Sundays, I will drive from Elk Grove to Lodi. It's a short 20-minute drive, and um, I'm getting used to it, but eventually, hopefully soon, we'll be moving into the parsonage here um, in Lodi, and we'll be able to begin the work um, when Corona uh, virus is over and all the restrictions are left, but even now, God is working through all of that. 
Um, but as I've been driving and commuting from Elk Grove to Lodi, you know, some, I don't know, probably in March, early March, I would drive and I would see all of these vines and there would be no leaves, no fruit, nothing on them. It was just this wood um, that had been pruned and, you know, it was beautiful, but it was missing something. And so I would just drive and I would notice all, all the vineyards and all the vines. And But recently, I have been driving and it's just gorgeous. It's beautiful. As I'm driving up 99, you see the green leaves begin to blossom on the vine and now it's getting fuller and fuller and fuller. And as I was praying, it's just been this um, opportunity for me, for me as I drive down 99 just to pray for Lodi and pray for Lodi Community Church. And it hit me as I this week that, you know, for days and weeks and sometimes months, I'm obviously not, not a, a vintner, I'm not a farmer, I don't know all the days and specifics, but I know for a good season that you're looking at this vine and it's just not that beautiful it, it's it's lacking something and yet in the midst of that season where you're looking at this pruned vine as the farmer who's been there before you know that it's in that season of waiting for the blossom waiting for the green leaves waiting for eventually the fruit it's in that season of waiting that you know that something is working and because you've been there before because you know a little bit about how vines grow and that you must prune them to be more fruitful. And every season there's this time of pruning and then there's a time of blossoming. You see, it's in this season of waiting that you must, as the farmer, recognize that something is at work. Otherwise, you may be depressed or discouraged, but even in that season of waiting, you're, you're, you're watering, you're making sure that the, the land is clean. I, Again, I am not a farmer. Uh, there's a member in our congregation, Stanley, who I'm sure uh, would be able to fill me in on all of the details of this. Um, and one day I hope to have that conversation, Stanley. But um, I do know this, that, that looking at it, it's just not that encouraging. You're looking at it, you're going, ah, it, it, it's bare. There, but there's something coming. There's something working, even in the midst of the waiting. And for me, that, that's just beautiful metaphor of how the kingdom of God works, that oftentimes we find ourselves in seasons of waiting, uh, seasons of barrenness, seasons of pruning that aren't fun, they can be uh, disorienting, they can be confusing, they can cause doubt to arise in our hearts, we can begin to question God, but it's in these seasons of barrenness it's in these seasons of what biblical authors often use this metaphor of the desert and the wilderness to um, illustrate this truth. That it's in these seasons of the desert and the wilderness of the, these barren waiting times that God is doing a work in us. And as we find ourselves in the middle of this pandemic, many people are waiting. Many people are disoriented. Many people are uh, riddled with anxiety and with fear. And I believe that God is working even in our waiting. And that's what I want to talk to you this morning about. And I want to use Acts 1-8 um, to illustrate this. And I want to unpack this with you together. So if you have your Bibles, you should be there. But we'll start in verse 1 and begin to unpack the text together this morning. So it says, In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. And a little background here. Luke um, wrote the Gospel of Luke, and he also wrote the book of Acts. Um, it's kind of a prequel, sequel. It's, it's part one, part two. And so I love how Luke writes this, and he says, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach, and that would be the Gospel of Luke. But that word begin means that he's not finished. And oftentimes when promises are made, we, we understand them, but there's, we live in this, and we talked about this in the last few weeks, that we live in this already not yet reality of the kingdom. And so although we know that God has begun a good work, he hasn't yet finished it. And so we find ourselves in this messy 
in between, this messy middle. We understand that there's something already that's happened. And, and for us as Christians, we recognize that the resurrection changed everything. But then we look around and we go, it hasn't changed everything yet. And we live in this already not yet reality between promises made and promises fulfilled. And so we understand that Jesus is not yet finished. And, and really, I don't know what your Bible says, but my Bible says the Acts of the Apostles. But really, the book of Acts is not the Acts of the Apostles. It's the Acts of Jesus through the Holy Spirit in the church, in the Apostles, working. And so what we understand here is that Jesus isn't finished yet. What he began in Luke and in the Gospels, in his life, death, and resurrection, now through his ascension and his glorification, Jesus is working through the church. But yet we find the disciples in this middle. Um, Jesus had been glor uh, resurrected, but he had not yet been glorified. And so the disciples find themselves in the middle. But he says, Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up. That's his ascension. After he had given commands through the Holy Spirit. In other words, Jesus is with the apostles. He's with his disciples. He's with the early church. And he's through the Holy Spirit, through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. He is giving them instructions moving forward. He's giving them promises. He's teaching them about the kingdom of God. And I just want to pause here. Actually, we'll go through that later, um, but let's keep going through the scripture. Verse 3, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And this morning, if you are wrestling with your faith, if you are questioning God, and um, I would remind you that every thing about Christianity hangs on the thread of the resurrection. And what we see here is that after Jesus was risen from the dead, he began to present himself alive to many, by many proofs. And the word there is, is logical rationale. It, it's, it's proofs. It's, it's convincing evidence that he is risen. In 1 Corinthians 15, it says that he appeared to about 500 and we can get into that at another time, but what we need to understand here is that Jesus is um, showing himself to be alive, resurrected. Verse 4, and while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. And that's really where I want to I stay and talk to you this morning about. Because for many of us, um, we too have been ordered not to depart from our homes, right? Um, we can relate with the disciples a little bit. You know, Jesus is saying, I tell you, do not depart from Jerusalem. And for many of us, we can relate in this season of COVID-19. We have been ordered by government officials to stay at home. And for many of us, we have this mandated uh, somewhat of a, of a rest or a waiting period where we don't know when reality or normal will come back. Mm -hmm. And so what we can relate to, and obviously there's other things going on here um, in, in the redemptive history of God's people, but we can identify with the disciples this morning and maybe learn a few things on how God works in our waiting and how we are to work in our waiting. And those are the two big ideas that I want to talk with you this morning about. And so it says that while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So again, the disciples find themselves in this messy middle, the in-between, between promise made and promise fulfilled. And many for many of us, this is our life. We live in the messy middle. Now, true, some of these promises, they will not be fulfilled until we get to glory, until Christ returns and makes all things new. But there are many promises that God makes us in the scriptures that sometimes we, for different circumstances, we do not feel or we do not experience or we do not see them fulfilled. And it's in that season of waiting that God is at work. In the song, it says that he is sanctifying us. He's making us more like himself. He's conforming us to the image of his son. I heard uh, one commentator uh, talk about where we find ourselves as the church. 
um, in this current pandemic. And he says, it feels like we are in the Holy Saturday. Christ had died, but he'd not yet been risen. We find ourselves in that Saturday or in that season of waiting. And I know for many of us, that's where we are. We are waiting. We don't know what it looks like on the other side. And in that moment of waiting, we can be disoriented. We can be confused. We can question God's goodness. Or does he even have this um, in control? What is going on? And what I feel like um, I want to bring to you this morning is that God is at work in our waiting. Verse 6, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, um, a lot of times people are a little harsh on the disciples here um, in that that they missed the point. Um, But all throughout scripture, God had promised that he would make things new, that he would restore things. And yet oftentimes when we are um, faced with this in-between or this place where we are um, between promise made and promise fulfilled, um, we're, we're thinking about ourselves. We're thinking about, we want it to return to normal. We want it to return to the way we used to know it or our hopes and our aspirations. Well, often, oftentimes, when we find ourselves in, in this middle, um, we're myopic. We're just thinking about ourselves and we don't understand that God is doing something bigger sometimes in our waiting. And for the disciples, they were thinking about Israel. God was thinking about the ends of the earth. They were thinking about having um, the comfort and control and the power of having Israel restored. And Jesus is thinking, no, you're going to be my witnesses to Jerusalem, yes, but then to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You see, oftentimes God in his working while we're waiting is doing something far bigger than we can even imagine. And yet they're focused on, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And for many of us in America, we could be focused on what God is doing in America and not realize what God is doing all over the globe. We must wrestle with our temptation to be myopic during seasons of waiting. And Jesus, I love this, in verse 7, he says, He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. In other words, God is sovereign. He knows exactly when COVID-19 will end. He knows exactly when the governments will open the restrictions. Even if the enemy meant something for evil, God is working for our good and his purposes in the world for his glory. I do not fear that. He is working for our good, and he is working for his glory. And yet we find ourselves in this time of waiting. How do we respond? But but one way that we respond is knowing that God is sovereign. He has fixed times and seasons to his own authority. But then, I love Jesus, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Oftentimes, when we lift our eyes from our myopia and off ourselves and and, and the blinders come off and we see a little bit into what God is doing, when he gives us that understanding, when he opens our eyes to understand the mission we see that it was so much bigger than what we wanted. And that it was necessary for us to go into a season of the wilderness or a season of barrenness or a season of the dark night of the soul, a season where we are confused and doubting. That's that's not, um, what's the right word? Having seasons of darkness or doubt, God is not intimidated by that. It doesn't make you a lesser Christian. In fact, seasons of this, we grow, our faith grows. For those that God has called, he is working in us, even in our seasons of waiting and wrestling. In fact, I would say that um, if you haven't yet experienced seasons of waiting and wrestling and seeing you and seeing God work through those in your life, that you are less mature than others, not Because that's how God works in every hero of the faith. In Jesus himself, there's seasons of the wilderness. There's seasons of darkness. There's seasons of 
the Garden of Gethsemane of wrestling and waiting. And so that's what um, I want to just share with you a, a little bit about a season in life where we experience this messy middle. Because for some of you, you're in the middle of that. And it may not even be related to pandemic, COVID-19. It just might be a season in your life, um, job-related, health-related, finance-related. I'm not sure what season you are in, but we experienced a season of barrenness. And I even asked my wife this morning to share with you our story of how God worked in our waiting. So with that, here's my wife, Tara. Good morning. So um, as Timothy was sharing, um, our, one of our first very early seasons in our marriage was barrenness. And um, just to give you a little backstory, we met in high school. We high school sweethearts. We were 16. And we quickly knew that we were one day going to get married. So then we did. We got married at the age of 19. And when Timothy used to ask me in high school, you know, everyone's always talking about what are you going to do after high school, what college are you going to go to? Um, my response was always, I want to be a mom. That's all I want to do. So I wasn't looking at going to any colleges. I wasn't looking at a career for the world, you might say. I wanted to be a mother, which I now know is the hardest job on the earth. But um, then, you know, Timothy and I go ahead and we get married at 19. He's going to college. I agree to work full time. And we have this plan that we're going to, you know, be married for about two years and then, you know, I'm going to become a mom. And I'm waiting and I'm excited and I'm waiting and I used to bug him all the time, like, okay, now? And he's like, no, wait. So two years pass and we look at each other and we're like, yes, let's have a baby. And so we're so excited. And in my family, you know, anything about my family, uh, everyone just had children very easily and naturally. So I thought, no big deal, I'm going to become finally a mom. And so we get pregnant, we're excited, we're ecstatic. We go through the first trimester, everything's looking good. We get to the second trimester, and I go to a doctor's appointment about 16 weeks pregnant, and there's no heartbeat. And um, that story, our first child, um, she passed away that night on October 31st. I was beyond devastated. Um, to even put that into words, it was the first loss in our family. Um, a child. The first, I was the first one to experience that. We were a part of a small church at that time. Um, I didn't know anyone all that well, so I had nowhere to go and to seek some counsel and just cry out. So, quietly mourning and grieving and mad. I was so angry with the Lord. I didn't understand why something that felt so right and so good and something that was good to achieve to become a mom. Um, was taken like that. So um, our first year, you know, the doctor goes, okay, just keep trying again. So we go and we try again, and we're trying and we're trying, and one year passes, nothing. Um, and at this time, we had people at our church begin to hear our story, and I think in a weird way, begin to ask us, when are you going to have a baby? And I'm like, I, I don't know. Ask the Lord. Um, and then my sister goes and gets married, and she begins to have children. My younger sister, and I have my older brothers, and they're having children. And I, I feel like at that moment in my life, there's just a spotlight on Timothy and I. Um, and the most often question I was constantly asked is, when are you going to have a baby? Well, year two passes, and we were then suggested to go to infertility. So first time doing that, and, and we begin to go through the whole entire process. And... Bad news after bad news after bad news after bad news. We kept getting reports that basically I would never be able to have children. To put this lightly, I mean, the words when I say devastated or anger doesn't seem to um, bring it into the emotions that I was feeling. My time with the Lord was dark. Um, I was wrestling with his goodness. I was wrestling with his faithfulness. I was wrestling with why, Lord, would you have this be so difficult? I was even willing to say, let's adopt. And um, at that time, Timothy and I just, we couldn't move past it. It felt like we were going to make something happen. After one doctor's appointment, um, we came home, and this was a big turning point for me. My husband came to me, and he said, you know, Tara, I feel that the Lord 
wants us to just stop and enjoy what we have in front of us. And not, not that we weren't going to stop praying for a child, but that we were going to look at what the Lord has given us. At that time, we were doing youth ministry. And so often we're always looking at what's in front of us and we look at what we don't have instead of what the Lord has given us. So he encouraged me. He's like, I, you know, I want to throw ourselves into ministry and let's, let's stop going to the doctor. We're done. We're done, done, done. And we are just going to throw ourselves into what the Lord has for us. I would love to tell you that that was easy, but learning how to wait and what my husband talked about working in the waiting um, was something that I didn't quite understand. You see, like, there's times that you think it's just because I don't have enough faith. That's why the Lord's not answering me. Or it's just because I didn't fast right or I broke the fast or I'm just not praying right that the Lord's not answering me. None of that is true. The Lord hears all of your prayers. But you're not the one that's going to move the hand of God in his timing because his timing is perfect. And that's difficult to understand. So for me, working while I was waiting was me looking at what was in front of me and saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you that I am in youth ministry and I'm able to minister to these children. Thank you that you have given me a marriage and a husband that loves you. And I was able to throw myself into being the best aunt. I, I loved being an aunt and I loved being a friend to all of my friends that were having babies. While I was waiting. And what began to grow in me was joy. Not fake joy. Not joy that comes when you get something. Joy that's constant in the waiting. Joy that's there in the morning. Joy that, that when you're weeping and wailing to the Lord while you're waiting, there is joy. And that's what began to birth in me as I was working in the waiting. And the bigger picture that I had no idea that the Lord was doing was in the body that we were currently attending at that time. He was using my tiny story to begin to minister to many people around us. There were so many people praying for us, so many people waiting for us to be given this child of God. And I really had no idea of all that he was doing behind me, behind the scenes. And the day that my husband and I found out we were pregnant, it was, it was 2003, it was a Thanksgiving service. And the pastor at the time said, you know, we're going to do just a Thanksgiving um, and, and just celebrate the goodness of the Lord. And that morning, my husband came to me with a pregnancy test. Now, if you know anything, I hated pregnancy tests at the time, so I wasn't very happy that he gave me one. But he's like, Tara, trust me, um, will you take this test for me? So I did, and we were pregnant. That morning, walking into that service, knowing what the Lord had done, I still was not prepared for what he was about to display in front of me. As the pastor concluded the service, he stood up and he said, we have one more reason to give thanks to the Lord. Timothy and Tara are pregnant. And I can't even describe, it was like a whole arena just jumped up for joy, screaming, praising the Lord. It was just a sea of people. And I'm standing there, literally, I, was, I don't think I was standing, I, I, I was sitting there weeping because I had no idea that the Lord was bringing through that one promise many other people's promises and stirring up their faith and stirring up their trust in Him. And so after the service, there were so many people that came up to me and were able to share with me what the Lord has shown them through our waiting. And so I want to encourage you guys in the waiting right now as Pastor Timothy is going to come and walk us through the rest of the scripture. The working part of it, don't think that there's a special formula. The working part of it is going, what is in front of me today? So like for me right now, an at-home mom, so I'm no longer working, I have before me five children home every single day, and now I'm going to be doing online distance learning, which is something that terrifies me. But in the working while I'm waiting for COVID-19 to open back up and we can kind of go back to some normalcy, I am 
working at being a mom to my five kids and saying, thank you, Jesus, that I get my five kids home every day, that I get to spend extra time with them, especially my older two girls that are in high school, that I get to be with them every single day. See, in, in the waiting, you get to go, Lord, this is not something that I, I want to have happen, but I'm going to work out what you're doing in this time in me, what you're growing in me, what you're pruning in me. So in our story today, now I'm able to stand on a platform and walk with many women through barrenness, many women through miscarriages, many women that are still waiting for their, their promised child. And, and I just stand as one of them amongst many of them to just encourage them that the Lord, he, he's working and his timing is perfect. But what are you doing while you're waiting? And that's what I've encouraged you today. Thanks. And it was amazing how many couples we met during that time and after that time that were either barren or you know, couldn't get pregnant, and we could encourage them, and we don't understand God's ways, but we do believe that God is working in our waiting. Romans 8, 28 says, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And in just a few other scriptures, he says that that purpose is to be conformed to the image of Jesus. That is the greatest purpose for us. And so in that, we are learning to uh, share burdens with other people, to um, think less about ourselves, and to think about others and to carry their weights. And oftentimes in these seasons of the wilderness or in the season of waiting, God is working deep in our hearts, deep in our soul. You see, um, for the disciples, they didn't understand what Jesus had to do. And how that it was for their benefit. It was for their good. And it was for his glory and for his purposes in the world. You see, he had mentioned it earlier in the Gospel of John in chapter 7, 38 to 39. Jesus said this, whoever believes in me, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive... For as yet the Spirit had not been given. Why? He tells us, because Jesus was not yet glorified. You see, Jesus, I mean, can you imagine the disciples' angst and their anxious hearts? They had spent three years with Jesus. He was their rabbi. He was their teacher. He was their friend. He was crucified. Their lives and their hopes were crushed. And then three days later, he rises from the grave. And before that, he had said, if I go, it will be better for you. I mean, you can only imagine the disciples going, yeah, right? You leaving? That's better for us? How is that better for us? And yet here, Jesus is teaching them kingdom of God through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit anointed upon him and they don't know that he has to leave he has to ascend and be at the right hand of God and be glorified so that he could then pour out the Holy Spirit in the church and that God would once again begin to commune with man and that the nations not just Israel but the nations would begin to hear about the crucified and risen Jesus from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And that's an outline of the entire book of Acts. The first few chapters, Jerusalem, then Judea and Samaria, and then all the way to Rome, to the ends of the earth. This is an outline of purposes in the world. And he's still continuing those purposes today. But Jesus had to be glorified. But can you imagine, like, the disciples' feelings of frustration and questioning during that season of waiting? As Jesus looks at them and he says, in verse 9, And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as, the, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. 
And we're still waiting for that great day, the day of the Lord, when Jesus returns and makes all things new. But there's little waiting periods, even in our own story of faith. But I want you to identify um, with the disciples. I mean, Jesus is just the one that they loved, the one that had changed their lives, the one that they left everything to follow. That Jesus ascends miraculously into heaven. And they're just left there looking at each other going, now what? He told us to wait. He told us to pray. He told us to work in our waiting. And you see, the beautiful thing about this is that God was at work. Jesus had to ascend into heaven. He had to sit at the right hand of God. He had to be glorified so that he could pour out the spirit on them And then to the earth. He had to. And so while they were waiting, God was working in heaven. While they were waiting, he was getting set up at the right hand of the Father, glorified so that Pentecost could happen. You see, we don't know what is happening in the unseen realm while we are waiting. We do not know what God is doing. But I do know this, that he is at work. And our life and our experience and our circumstances might look like that pruned vine that I saw on Highway 99. But the good news of Jesus Christ is that those that he loved, those that love him and are called according to his purpose, he is pruning you for your good and for his glory. And the green leaves and the fruit is coming in due time. You see, oftentimes while we are waiting, um, we need to ask this question, why is it difficult? And I put this on the digital liturgy. I put this on one of the application questions. Why is it difficult to wait on God's promises? And for the disciples, um, we have to recognize that oftentimes these promises that were given, whether they're through scripture or in other places, um, that these promises are often associated with personal pain. Like we had seen God move and we believed that God was going to open Tara's womb. Um, But it was a place of pain. It was a place of desire, um, of longing that was taken away. And oftentimes in these seasons of waiting, God is crushing our idols. Now now having a baby is a good thing, but when you put too much Um, importance or significance in a good thing and it becomes an ultimate thing or a little g God thing, that's a bad thing. And so we must realize that oftentimes God's purpose is to draw us nearer to himself, to see him as ultimate. And these times of waiting and of wilderness and of wanting and of wrestling, these are the times where we draw nearer to him. And that's why I've been talking the last few weeks about drawing near to God in the secret place. Why? Because I believe that when God begins to take away the things, I mean, just think about this pandemic. Um, Major league sports, gone. Entertainment, movies, gone. Parks, gone. And someone brought this up for those that are single and maybe seen you know, sex as an idol and, and some place of pleasure and of significance. That is most likely gone because they can't see or hook up on Tinder or something. God has been taking down the idols of our culture. And church, what is our response in this time of waiting? It is to press in. Why? Because it's in the waiting that we receive the power of God to be his witnesses. Like the disciples, Jesus tells them, in your waiting, begin to work. Now, this idea of working is something that we can often get confused. And I am um, winding down. But if you have your Bibles... Turn to Philippians chapter 2 because I really believe, and we might just have part 2 next Sunday um, and talk more about prayer. But in Philippians chapter 2, I do want to set this uh, truth and this foundation before we pray and close. Um, In Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And many times we hear that from preachers, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But there's a comma right after trembling. And we have to finish the sentence. 
It says, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You see, the reality is, is that while we are working in faith, he's working in us. So that Paul could say, I worked harder than all the other um, apostles, but it was the grace of God at work in me. You see, for us to understand this dynamic, we must get this right. We are not working for the promise. There's nothing that we can do in and of our own strength to obtain the promises of God. But we work from the promise because we trust the promise maker. So we work from the promise. If God has said, I will do this in his word, then we work from that promise because we believe the one who made the promise. And the great work really is trusting him. It's enjoying what is in front of us, as Tara mentioned. It's enjoying what God has given us in our laps. Oftentimes we get too concerned about the promise, that we are to keep the promise in mind, and we are to pray for the promise and contend for the promise. But we cannot be so focused on the promise that we neglect abiding in Christ. Because here we see that we are to work out your own salvation. That these promises that God has given us, we are, they are yes and amen in Christ. And therefore, we are to work out of those promises our own salvation, which is a promise in and of itself. With fear and trembling, there must be a sense of urgency. Um, I loved what Louis Giglio one time said about this, that it's a furious rest. Meaning inwardly, we know that God is sovereign, so we are lazy or apathetic. That we have a furious sense of working out of our salvation because God has promised us, promised us that. But it doesn't mean that we are apathetic or lazy. It's a furious tent, but I am working. And we see that in the Apostle Paul all the time. That's why he could say, I'm working harder than the rest of the apostles, but it's not I, but it's the grace of God in I, in me. And that's in 2 Corinthians um, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10, if you want to look it up. But again, I, I, when we have this understanding of working out our own salvation, of working f out of our promise, not working for our promise, um, and with the understanding that God is sovereign, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. See, God is working in you for his good pleasure. But that doesn't mean you just wait and do nothing. It means that you work deeply to trust him. That's why Paul can say in verse 14 in Philippians chapter 2, do all things without grumbling or disputing, complaining, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding out, holding fast to the word of life. You see, when we are working for the promise, we begin to grumble. We begin to complain because it's not happening in our own time. But when we begin to trust God and we begin to work out of the promise, we do, as Tara mentioned, begin to experience joy because we are trusting in the promise maker who has shown himself faithful, first and foremost, at the cross and in the resurrection. And that shapes everything moving forward. And so we don't grumble, we don't complain, but instead we become, as we do that, we become blameless and lights in the world, in the midst of a crooked and depraved generation. Why? Because in this crooked and depraved generation, they are stressed out because they are longing for things in their own terms. And they're frustrated because it's not happening. And so, this morning, how do we respond in the waiting? And we're going to touch on this next week, but it's two things. Jesus-centered, scripture-based, spirit-led prayer, and a healthy work and rest dynamic in our lives. You see, when we work out our salvation, we need to trust in Christ and rest in Him. But then when we rest and we implement things like Sabbath in our lives and we're resting physically, but inwardly we're working to trust. 
And we need to understand those dynamics because even as I work out my fear or I work out my salvation in fear and trembling, I have to also understand and believe that it's God at work in me. So even as I'm waiting, God is working. As as I'm working, I know that God is working as well. And then this idea of Jesus-centered, scripture-based, spirit-led prayer. We see that's exactly where Jesus invited the disciples to go. He had taught them in Luke, tra- Luke chapter 24 to see all of Scripture through the lens of Christ and to use those Scriptures um, to form their prayer life and that it would be Spirit-led prayer that leads them through the time of wilderness, through the time of waiting, until the promise is fulfilled. And some promises, they will not be fulfilled until heaven, until Christ returns, the day of the Lord. But for those that God has seen to make in our own time, we continue to wait, trusting that God is at work. And we work in the midst of our waiting, knowing underneath it all, God is at work. So that like that vine, and there may be times of barrenness and of pruning, but we trust that God is at work and that in his time, one day, The green leaves will blossom and the fruit will come and it will be for the glory of God and for the good of us. Let's pray. Jesus, this morning, you would speak to our hearts. Like the disciples, we may be in this season of waiting, this season of the in-between. Now, ultimately, Jesus, we understand that you have ascended, you have been glorified, and the church is now, the Holy Spirit has been poured out for the church. For all who would believe that promise is available. But there may be other promises that we aren't feeling, that we aren't experiencing, that you've given us personally, corporately, as a church, And we're waiting, and we're wondering. We're in the wilderness. We don't understand why. So this morning, I pray that if we find ourselves in a season of waiting, which many of us are, and we don't know what the future looks like, I just pray this morning that we would trust that God, you are working. And because you are working, as it says in Philippians 2, working for your own pleasure, for your glory and our good, because we trust that you are working, we can do the hard work of trusting you and walking out this everyday life, doing all things without grumbling and complaining so that we would shine like stars in a crooked and depraved generation. Father, make your church shine during this season. I ask God that you would cause your church to draw near to you, to do the work trusting that you are working, so that we would do the work and pray and seek you, so that, God, you would begin to empower us to be the witnesses that, God, you are calling us to be in this time and in this season. There is a great opportunity for the church in these days. And I pray that, God, we would learn the power of seeking you in the secret place and of drawing near and trusting in your work and our waiting so that we might be the witnesses that God has called us to be in this time and season. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hopefully that ministered to you this morning. Um, Every Sunday we end with a song and you know I know that ideally we'd have live worship leaders and this isn't the best but I ask you to engage and I ask you to lean in read the songs sing pray look at the scriptures ask the Holy Spirit to begin to speak to you so that you would begin to abide with him in prayer and contend for the things of the kingdom in prayer well talk about that some more next week. But I just encourage you this morning. 
if you are in a season of waiting, that this song would be the prayer of your heart. Spirit, lead me. Spirit, lead me. Show me what's next. Teach me how to work in the waiting. Teach me to trust that God is at work in my waiting. Holy Spirit, lead me. So I encourage you this morning, um, in your home, wherever you may be watching this, listen, sing, pray, and then engage with us online. Let us know how you are doing. Let us know how we can pray for you. Let us know, and if you need to do it in a more private manner, not in the comment section on Facebook, then I just encourage you to reach out to me um, via Facebook, email, or text. Be happy to pray for you, um, meet with you over Zoom or a phone call. But church, let's be the church, um, empowered by the Holy Spirit in this time of waiting. Amen.